G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. I'm going to do a series on FPV. Now I've done a few series before and tried to introduce the basics of FPV to people but every year of course there are new people coming into the hobby and they don't know about FPV and every year things change, technology improves, new products come on the market so what I'm going to try and do here is just sort of introduce you step by step to the technology we use for FPV and explain the pros and cons of all the options. It's obviously going to be a fairly long series. I'm going to start with cameras because any FPV system is only as good as the weakest link and the most important link of course is creating an image and that's where your camera comes in. If you have a crap camera it doesn't matter how good your video transmitter is, it doesn't matter how good your video receiver is, it doesn't matter how good your goggles or your antennas are, you're going to have a crap experience. So you've got to start with a good picture and there are so many options for cameras that it can leave most people a little bit bewildered and befuddled. I know I'm like that all the time so I'm going to try and clarify a little bit of it for the people who haven't flown FPV before and maybe people who are flying FPV now and not having such good results. So first of all I'm going to talk about this type of camera. These are the cameras that are sold as dedicated FPV cameras. They're designed for FPV use so they say, although to be honest most of them are simply repurposed security cameras. And some have been tweaked and tuned to work better with FPV but you know they tend to be the same sort of cameras you'd find in the average closed circuit TV setup. So let's have a look at what we got here. This is a board camera. It's called a board camera not because it is sort of sitting there not interested in anything, it's because it's on a board. You can see the circuit board there. The little circuit board, there's no case, there's no mounting brackets, there's nothing. All you get is the board with the sensor underneath and the camera lens on the front. And this used to be quite handy for things like mini quads because most of them came with a little frame you could bolt this to and it would sit in your mini quad. These days, not so popular because uh, the difficulties in mounting them. Having said that, what you can do, if you buy a board camera, you make some one of these, something, you can make something like this out of core flute. See, I just made a little case out of core flute for this board camera with Velcro on the bottom so I can just pop it on a model and away I go. So board cameras, if you've got one, you can use it because you can make a little box up for it and it goes on top of fixed wing or anything you like. That's one way of doing it. But as I say, it's much easier now if you just buy a camera that's designed for FPV use and comes with a mounting bracket. And here are probably the most common ones you're going to encounter. First of all, let's put those two aside. This is a CCD camera. This is the Aomway. This one was provided by Hobby King for review purposes. And it's a 700 TV line, um, 2.1 millimeter lens. I'll explain all this later, but the key things on this box, the key things you need to know about are, and I'll find my pen to point them out. First of all, this uh, resolution here, 700 TV lines, that gives you an indication of how sharp the picture should be. It can be deceptive because honestly, as I said, weak link territory. The video transmitter and receiver are usually the limiting factor. Once you get above 600 TV lines, you're not going to see much improvement. You can buy 1200 TV line cameras and that is 1200 TV lines. That's nearly twice the resolution of this camera. But they're not going to be twice as sharp because the video transmitter and receiver are going to limit the number of lines, effective number of lines that can be sent. And also your video goggles are going to limit because this is the horizontal resolution. So this would require a monitor with at least 700 pixels across to give you um, a picture that was going to be as sharp as the camera could produce. And most of the LCD glasses we've got are 640 or at the best 800 across. So this is sort of already hitting the limits of maximum resolution and passing them sometimes. And the other thing to look at here is DC 3.8 to 5.5 volts. That's a pretty narrow voltage range. You can't whack this camera across your LiPo because what will happen if you do is that smoke will come out of it. Um, it's a very limited voltage range so uh, you have to use it with a transmitter that has a built-in voltage regulator or use a UBEC to power it from your LiPo pack. It can be a limiting factor. Now also there's a 2.1 that should be millimeter color lens. They're all color. What are you talking about? <laughs> I've yet to see a black and white lens but it's a color lens. It's just a 2.1 millimeter lens which means it's pretty wide angle. That's probably the widest angle you'd want to use in an FPV model. More suited to multi-rotors than to fixed wing because you really need the peripheral vision that a wide angle lens gives you with a multi-rotor. Not so much with a fixed wing because you can't fly fixed wing models sideways. It also says it is MOL JST Connect. Well, that's just the connector on the back. Hmm. But the key thing that they have forgotten to include here is what type of sensor. Now there are two types. There is CCD and there's CMOS. Actually that's more likely MOS. There's other types of MOS as well but CCD and then some type of MOS. Um, this is a MOS camera. This is a CMOS camera. I'm going to show you 
the difference between CMOS and CCD in this little piece of video here which I took. On the right hand side of your screen is the HS117, that's one of these other cameras I've got here. It is a CCD camera. On the left hand side is a CMOS camera and you'll notice that when I point the cameras up to the sky, the ground remains unchanged in terms of its contrast and brilliance on the HS1177 on the right hand side of your screen, but on the left hand side the brightness of the ground varies dramatically depending on how much sky is in the frame and that's not good because if you've got a really bright sky the ground can go black and that's not a good look at all. You lose, you lose any kind of resolution on the ground. So CMOS cameras are cheaper and for example this little AOM here I think it's about $24. 24 bucks for this. You can buy CMOS cameras as cheap as $9 if you just get a board camera version. The little board camera ones, nine bucks. Cheap as beans, but but you get what you pay for. And there's no way a, 20, a $9 or a $24 camera is going to perform as well as one of these because these are not MOS cameras, not CMOS cameras. These are CCDs. And both of these cameras are pretty sim similar because really they're pretty much the same guts inside. This is the Runcam Swift. This is a camera that Runcam are producing and they're pushing it as an FPV camera. It's got a different kind of mounting on the back here. It's quite a robust mounting system and it has this little bracket up the front here so you can hang it from the top of a, of a mini quad or something like that. You can bolt it down and it means you can also tilt, change the angle. So that's really handy. So this has got some good mounting hardware. I've done a review or a little bit of intro. Um, Yes, I've done a review actually. I've compared this one to this one because this is a more generic HS1177. They're both HS1177s, but uh, what's happened here is Runcam have taken it, tweaked it, and called it a Swift. This one, for example, is a Surveil Zone version, as you can see by the writing on it. And this is a more generic HS1177. These are CCD cameras. They have much better light handling than the CMOS or other MOS cameras. Really, really is important. And I'd have to say that the most important aspect of a, CC, of, of a FPV camera is its light handling abilities. They all work pretty well on a sunny day with the sun high in the sky when you're flying you know, in unchallenging lighting conditions. But once you get a cloudy day or sun's low on the horizon, these cameras are supreme and they outperform anything else you're likely to come across. Now these are a pretty, still a pretty low cost camera. 30 to, 35 to 40 bucks will buy you one of these. There are a number of companies sell them. Runcam have theirs, which they call the Swift. We've got Surveil Zone, they have an HS1177. You've got the uh, what is it, Security Camera 2000. They also sell HS1177. And Foxia, which is another brand, they sell one under the name A, what is it, XAT600. And I think it's an M. I better check, make sure it's not a different one. Yep, AT600M. That's the equivalent from Foxia. So, yeah, you can get these from a number of sources. I'll put links in the description of this video so you can go and find out where to buy the damn things. And as I say, all the suppliers have a pretty good reputation. I've heard very few complaints about any of the companies I'll be linking to. I don't get any kickbacks, I'm just making, giving you the widest choice available. So these are the ones to go for in my book. You know, if you're trying to find an FPV camera, these are the ones to go for. They are just uh, super, super good. Really, really good. I use them as my first camera of choice. Any of the HS1177s. Now, uh, there are of course other options for FPV cameras, but before I look at those in another video, I want to talk a bit more about the things you can get on here which make a difference. First of all, obviously, that lens. I mentioned that the CMOS one had a 2.1 millimeter lens. That means it's very wide angle. These ones can usually be bought with either a 2.8 millimeter lens or a 3.6 millimeter lens. What does that mean? Well, 2.8 millimeters is not quite as wide angle as the one I had on here, or the one that's on here. And 3.6 millimeters is even less of a wide angle lens. So which one do you choose? Well, if you're flying fixed wing, I prefer the 3.6 millimeter lens on my fixed wing models because, as I said, you don't need to know what's immediately out to your left or right because you can't go sideways. Uh, multi rotors, 2.8 millimeter rules, you need that peripheral vision to, uh, to see where you're going. And if I had to choose one for all my models, it would be 2.8. You can still fly fixed wing perfectly fine with 2.8 millimeters, and some people prefer it. So 2.8 is probably the one to go for. It's the most versatile lens size. And there's one other thing, one other very important thing you've got to look at. Whether or not you use an infrared block filter. And what's that? Well, the CCD devices in these cameras is sensitive to infrared light as well as visible light. And that means if you don't filter out the infrared, it can affect the colours and other aspects of the camera's operation. So if you're going to be using your camera during the day, mainly during the day when there's lots of sunlight around, then you need an IR blocked camera. And it usually says on the box, and you can select when you're buying, whether you have IR blocked or not. So if you're going to be using it in anything other than really low light conditions, like twilight in the evenings or dawn, then 
the IR blocked camera will give you much more vibrant colors, more, much more accurate colors, and you'll have a much nicer picture. But if you want to fly in a wide range of lighting conditions and you're prepared to sacrifice some of the color accuracy, then get an unblocked one or just one without a block, one without an IR filter, and you'll find it's much more sensitive under very low light conditions. But having said that, if you want to go low light, then it's really worth looking at something like the Runcam L, which is a camera designed specifically for low light use. And it saves compromising. You buy the Runcam L, it's going to work really well in low light, but, but not so well in full sunlight because, and wait for it, it has a MOS sensor. So it doesn't have the, the ability to handle the bright sunlight um, and dark ground situation nearly as well as a CCD camera like these, but in twilight or late evening, it excels at what it does. So choose the right camera for the job. Decide when you're going to be flying. Choose the camera appropriately. And finally, as I mentioned before, this camera has a very narrow voltage range. As I said, as we looked on the box, it runs from, where is it over the side here? From 4.5 volts up to 5, or 4 volts up to 5.5 volts. Very narrow range of voltages. Can't whack it over your LiPo. These cameras tend to have a much wider range of operation. In the case of the Runcam Swift, it'll operate from, what have we got on the box here? From 5 volts to 17 volts. What does that mean? Well, that's basically from 1 to 4, oh, sorry, from 2 to 4 cells. So you can run on a 2 cell to 4 cell pack without the need to have any kind of voltage regulation or BECs or anything in the way. That's pretty damn good. The, f the, the other one, the HS117, the straight HS117 from Saval Zone or, or other places, uh, so, uh, that has a much wider voltage range. It will go from 5 volts to 22 volts. So you could run it, in theory, on a 5-cell pack as well. Although, yeah, not many people run more than 4 cells on their FPV models, but if you want to run more than 4 cells, then the HS117 is probably going to be a better bet than the Swift because you still won't have to use a regulator. Can you run this on 6 cells? Mm, well, a fully charged 6-cell pack is a lot more than 22 volts, so I wouldn't. In which case, either of those would be fine. And if you're running on three or four cells, either of these is fine. But five cells, that's your choice. Um, there you go. That's pretty simple. Not much else to say. Now, if you've got questions or comments about these cameras, because, you know, it can still be a bit bewildering, let me know. Put them in the comments section on this video. I'll do my best to answer them. And what I'll be looking at in the next video, excuse me while I clear some space on the bench because you want to see, is the other options. And they include things like these and this and this and this and oh, got to reach around the other side because there's so many options as I say it is bewildering it's no wonder people get so totally confused things like this and this now all of these can be used as an FPV camera just like these ones over here the difference is they all have some weaknesses that are basically the reasons why I wouldn't use them as my first option for FPV. But they have other strengths. They have strengths in other areas. So the next video on FPV, I'll be looking at these because a lot of people already have these. Can I use them as an FPV camera on my plane? That's what you want to know. Can I use them as an FPV camera on my multi-rotor? Are they any good for racing quads? I'll answer all those questions in the next video. And uh, after that, we'll look at things like video transmitters, antennas, video receivers and video display devices, including goggles, visors and LCD screens. So there you go. Thanks for watching. I will now clear my bench and get on with the reviews. Bye for now.